So uh, economic theory of the last 50 years has, has uh, known some important developments. And of course, typically, if you say that to an audience of people who are not economists, they will say, hmm, sure, are you, sh are you sure, really? <laughs> Especially since we have seen what happened in 2008. I'm from England, and uh, the Queen of England, when she was meeting some very important economists, uh, I don't know, at the Royal Palace or whatever, she was asking this group of distinguished economists, she was asking, look, uh, did you not see this coming? Uh, what was going on in 2000? What was, uh, what was uh, unfolding uh, just behind us in 2008? So, of course, it has a, a very re bad reputation since 2008, I think, but, uh, okay, well, we can discuss this more, but, uh, yeah. So um, I think uh, Sandro has been talking a little bit about expected utility very briefly, uh, especially he was mentioning uh, some of the paradoxes, decision-making paradoxes. A lot of uh, microeconomic theory is based on uh, models of expected utility because lots of the models uh, deal with utility functions and have to have an underlying axiomatic structure. Um, and this underlying axiomatic structure is also, of course, a function of the types of probabilities you want to use. Uh, and Sandro, in his papers, has uh, talked quite a lot about some of the, the uh, uh, essential models. So here you have a first one, uh, which is very the workhorse, basically, of uh, a lot of people in economics, is, is the, the von Neumann-Morgenstern uh, expected utility model, um, which uh, uh, is used in quite a lot of uh, 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 models in, in economics, and the uncertainty there is seen as being objective. Um, if you go into uh, the models which, um, well, actually this one already has a paradox also, but for instance in uh, what Sandra was mentioning, the Ellsberg paradox, you will see that for instance we have violations of uh, some of the axiom, the shorting principle in the next model I will mention, which is the Ellsberg, the, um, sorry, the, um, um, uh, uh, the, um, wait, let me, I forgot the name now, the uh, Savage model. And so the Savage model, I mean, if you want to know more about the Savage model, which is actually dealing with subjective probability, so the underlying probability used for, ex for the formulation of expected utility here is a subjective probability measure. Um, uh, there's a very nice little book here by David Krebs, Notes on the Theory of Choice. Very small little book, but if you really want to know a little bit more about those models, I mean, they're very, very well described in, in that very little book, and it's a very cute little book. So that, that second model is this uh, Savage by 72, very famous statistician, and he um, developed an axiomatic structure for expected utility, which was based on um, uh, subjective probability. And then uh, a model which is very often not mentioned is the one which, mix, which mixes both. Um, and there's the Anscombe Aumann model. Aumann from the famous Aumann from uh, uh, who won the Nobel Prize, and that's a mixture of subjective and objective probability. <coughs> so those are kind of uh, uh, any any graduate student in economics is is is, is going to know about those models and, and probably will be able to appreciate uh, the um, the subtleties in the axiomatic underpinnings of, of each of those of, of each of those three models, and they're they're used mainly. The von neumann morgenstern model is used uh, heavily, of course, in, in, in a lot of applications in public finance, uh, uh, of course, microeconomic theory also, but also you will also find it in in, in macroeconomics. So it's it's very very workhorse type of uh, models, and um, what happened um, in the 80s and, and, and more towards the 90s actually was that, of course, those paradoxes had been around, Alice and Ellsberg paradoxes had been around, and the expected utility theories, which I've just been discussing, actually, this especially the uh, Savage expected utility, had to address some of those um, paradoxes. And, and that was done via uh, the intervention of Mark Maschina, which uh, Sandro also was mentioning, but also in work by Gilbo and Schmeidler. Right? Uh, they also uh, came up with uh, very important alternatives uh, in the literature to address um, those paradoxes. But I don't know in what way, uh, Sandro, you have found this to be uh, too reasonably conclusive or not. Uh, we can discuss maybe afterwards, but... Yeah, 
the funding property and all Yes, that. Uh, so you know that the Ellsberg paradox cannot be uh, solved by using uh, a Savage expected utility theory. So even considering uh, uh, subjective probabilities, including subjective probabilities. Then uh, there is the work by, by Machina, by, uh, by Gilboa, by, by Marinucci. There are other guys who proposed uh, extensions of classical probability theory that uh, 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 that solved the, the Ellsberg paradox. But uh, uh, there was a new paradox that is Ellsberg type and it was proposed by machine itself in 19, 2009. And uh, this is the machina paradox, which cannot be explained by none of these approach, approaches. So none of them can cope with machina. So there is no generalization of expected utility theory that can cope with the machina paradox. This is why we came to a quantum modeling. It's interesting what you say because um, we this was proved by uh, Placido, the Maridon, and by Yomi in 2011. None of these approaches can cope with machina. Okay, because it's interesting what you say uh, because this event which happened at University of California, Irvine, I uh, actually had Mark Machina as in the audience, and uh, but he didn't uh, didn't say that much about that. Um, so those were other works which were very famous in the 90s, at least, um, as a response uh, to this. And outside of the theory of choice, which is so much underpinning uh, a lot of, of economics, uh, there were, of course, other uh, milestones. Of course, you may have heard about the theory of rational expectations, which is a very, very important theory in, in a lot of macroeconomic models. And much, much less, much less well known is the theory of rational beliefs, which was developed by Mordechai Kurz at uh, Stanford in the economics uh, department, but which actually I don't think ever caught on as an alternative to uh, rational expectations theory. So, okay, so I, as I said, I mean, this is just a very, very brief uh, overview of what, what I think are the, the kind of the major milestones, maybe in economics, I mean, it's non-exhaustive, of course, uh, but just to kind of set the tone of where we are going. So now the next thing here I want to discuss is uh, give you a very brief overview of what I think are some financial economics and econophysics milestones without going in any great detail uh, but mention some uh, here at this point. Um, uh, of course, you have all heard about this, and Sandra also already talked about it too, uh, Black School's option pricing theory, which of course was, was, is, is a very big milestone for finance, for financial, maybe for, for finance, uh, much, much less for economics. It's very, very important to say that this is not really a milestone for economics. And I think there's a very, very good reason why it is not really a milestone for economics, because exactly it's not using any preferences. So it is not making any appeal to utility theory. So all the business I've been talking about just at the beginning on expected utility and so on, those things you do not need at all in option pricing theory. So there's an enormous divorce, I think, between what came around here via uh, Black Schools theory and which actually made finance to become a very, very important discipline. Uh, there's a very important divorce from fi uh, of finance from economics via this theory there. It's, it's really important to, to know that because uh, I think that's, that's uh, something which is fairly much uncontested. Um, <clears throat> so that was developed by Black and Schools in 73. Has, of course, as you know, probably, um, uh, <laughs> it's interesting to know, actually, uh, I think maybe, maybe you don't know this, but uh, in fact, this, this, the development of this formulation actually created a huge market, a trillion dollar market. Uh, and there is a very interesting sociological study which was made on this by a colleague of uh, Sandro and us, uh, Yuval Milo, which was published in the American Journal of Sociology back in the, uh, I'm not sure what date. Uh, it's it's a, a study which actually shows that after this formula came to being, an enormous market was created out of this formulation. And it was, this, this study was actually done on the basis of interviews they did with very prominent people in, in the future and forwards and, and option trading business. And it's a very nice paper. If you want to have the reference, I, uh, I didn't put it here. But it's a very interesting phenomenon. Um, we also saw in, the, in 19, uh, 1989 some improvements on uh, a model which, which is 
you may not have heard of, maybe it's the so-called capital asset pricing model, which, um, which we like to teach our students. And, and basically this, this holds this promise, this capital asset pricing model holds this promise that you can uh, determine the expected return of an asset on the basis of, of the knowledge of a risk-free rate. So a risk-free rate basically is a, is a, is a return on, on an asset which is risk-free, which does not entail any risk in holding it plus uh, a multiplicative factor, which is what we call a beta, which is a, a covariance between the return of the asset and, and what we call the market return over the variance of the market return, and, and a premium and, 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 and an error term. Now, that looks extremely appealing. If you see that for the first time, you say, wow, that's very simple. I mean, can you imagine that we, we can actually uh, determine the expected return of an asset I on the basis of such a simple formulation? And of course, when you're a graduate student in finance, especially in North America, where I was, you would have to read all those papers in terms of, uh, in, in, in preparation of your comprehensive exams. And I remember, I remember it like it was yesterday, and it's a long time ago. I remember it like it was, it was really, it was so hard, because there were so many papers which were disproving this theory, and so many papers which were proving the theory. And it's, uh, maybe it's uh, something which uh, we have typically in finance, where we have, um, yeah. So, but uh, it, it's a very simple theory, but in 89 there were improvements on the theory, and especially uh, through this work by Breeden uh, in, in 89. And here, this is that uh, quite famous paper in this. So th those, those, that's another ma milestone, I think, in, in finance also. Um, I think it's uh, probably safe to say that the overwhelming majority of contributions to economic theory were, were done probably mostly by mathematicians and in, in, in certainly in economic theory. Because if you look at, for instance, expected utility theory, I don't know what the profession was of Morgenstern, but of course von Neumann, you know. I mean, uh, Savage was a statistician. Uh, Aumann... I think is a mathematician also, I think. Gilbo and Schmeidler are mathematicians. I don't know about Maschine. Uh, right. So a lot of people, certainly from the applied maths community, uh, have contributed ma massively in, in, in the field of economics. Now, in the 80s and 90s, you'll start seeing contributions from physicists uh, to economics. And, and really, it, uh, I think it has to be said, uh, the, the, the real protagonist in the field of using physics concepts, especially statistical physics concepts in economics, the real protagonist there is really uh, Eugene Stanley uh, from Boston uh, University. I mean, he set up the whole movement really on, of what we call econophysics, which are really applications of really statistical physics to economics and finance. Uh, and he was, he was uh, really the person who, who started the whole movement. So, oh, it's, I'm so sorry, it's very small. It's very stupid, why did I do it? Can you, can you read it? Well, I can, I can just read it. Um, <clears throat> so it was him here. He is still a very, very active person. Uh, and uh, um, in, especially in this field, and, um, but also in other fields. Um, there have been then, uh, since I would say, the, I think this is probably more the beginning of the 90s actually, um, uh, a lot of developments in the econophysics field, so why is this not working, here by uh, people like uh, Damien Chalet on, on minority games, which became a very important contribution but then died out. Um, uh, I mean, this, is, this was one of the papers here, uh, which was published in Physica A, which is, by the way, if, you, if you've never heard of this, this uh, econophysics area, I mean, uh, Physica A is, is basically the, uh, the, the journal where all, most of those publications are published. I mean, it's, it's not completely true, actually, because Physical Review E also has hosted quite a lot of uh, publications in that field. Um, uh, in, in the area, for instance, of option pricing, there have been enormously important contributions. I, I always like to cite very much this work by Lisa Borland, who is from the physics community, who was in, worked in the industry, and who actually came up with a very, very nice paper on generalizing uh, option pricing theory, so that uh, you can actually use uh, the densities, uh, the probability density functions, which are much, much more general than the usual uh, log normal which we use in, in the basic uh, black scholes theory. And um, it's interesting also to see, this is a very beautiful paper, it's also interesting to see how uh, few times this paper is quoted in finance literature. You virtually never see it quoted. 
although it's, I think, a very, very important paper, I think. And I'm not the only one to say that. I think other people will, will, will agree with me. But it is very, it's quoted uh, not often at all. Um, so this was published in Quantitative Finance, and it was also published in Physical Review Letters to some degree, uh, I think. But I don't know which version was actually um, published. And of course, they have had, like this new movement, uh, Sandro and uh, Acasio, and a little bit myself, are working on. Uh, there's a lot of conferences which, of course, have occurred, uh, especially also conferences which funded, were funded by the European Science Foundation. Uh, a lot of those uh, were um, uh, run under that uh, funding source. Now, let me just go over a little bit this uh, new field, maybe, uh, which, which tries or attempts to connect social science and quantum physics. Um, and I think you can probably uh, look at uh, groups of applications, uh, so in decision making and psychology, there are, uh, that's, that's one area uh, where uh, important contributions have uh, been made. Of course, uh, here we have this uh, Sandro's paper uh, with uh, Dietrich Arts. Um, this is another one here, which is also very interesting um, in the decision making area. And then, of course, we also have the work by Jerome Busemeyer. And I think Sandro or Acasio, I think you would agree that it's probably this is the starting paper in the field, the 2006 uh, Journal of Mathematical Psychology paper. I, okay, I agree, uh, there are some, in fact, there is a paper in the AI Stanford Proceedings, which precedes that one, I think, right? Or is it afterwards? Yeah, yeah. Is that, it's, it's, uh-huh, yeah. Uh huh, yeah, okay. But the AAI paper came before that one, no? Afterwards, okay. Okay, oh, okay, okay. So I got the dates wrong. Um, uh, Acasio has done very nice work also in the same journal. In fact, this journal has um, hosted quite a lot of papers in the area of decision making and actually is now branching out this, uh, because Jerome Busemeyer, if I'm not mistaken, was editor of the journal and now has started a new journal, but I forgot the name, um, Psychological Review, or which he's the main uh, founding editor from. Eh? He just started it now. Yes, yes, you d he was, uh -huh. no, that's right, yeah, 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 yes, yes, yes. So, and here, of course, you have the paper by uh, Jennifer, which appeared in, in uh, Psychological Science. So, that's in the area of decision making, and I, I, Acasio and Sandro will, well, Sandro, uh, Acasio will talk more, I think, about uh, this area. Uh, there's also an area which uh, is probably not so active anymore now, uh, the area of quantum games. Um, which, uh, I think, the, the protagonist there was really Jens Eisert, um, who introduced the idea of qubit states in, in quantum games. And then, I mean, Piotrowski and Sadkowski were doing some additional work on that, but I think this really the real paper here is this one here underneath, if you want to know a little bit more about quantum games. That's the one here. I think this is now died off, actually, because basically the Iser paper actually put a point under it. I mean, this is it. We know what it is. Um, <coughs> there's some other additional uh, work by Arfi and, okay. So that's the second area, game theory, and then there is a bit, I think this is a much newer area in finance and financial economics, but, uh, well, it's a newer area and not, because in some sense, a lot of those seeds on finance and financial economics actually were already laid by uh, Andrei Krenikov uh, in a very famous paper he published in Foundations of Physics in 1999, or, well, I'll, I'll give you the quote. There is also another book here by Baki, uh, Bilal Baki. I'll discuss some of his work tomorrow, actually. Uh, I think Bilal is doing, uh, of course, b b the way B uh, Bilal is working uh, on, on what, what he calls quantum finance is really a path integration. So a path integration view of finance, so an avoidance of using stochastics. And that's kind of uh, the approach he's following. And uh, he wrote a very nice book 
in, in, uh, on that topic uh, which appeared with Cambridge University Press in 2004 and which is now in a reprint. He has other books on the, f uh, on, on the topic too and he has also published articles in Physical Review E on, on, the, topic uh, on, on, on the topic also. So um, we have a book also, Andre and myself, uh, in, in which has appeared just now and then also there's some, some, um, some article uh, two little articles which have appeared in New Scientist, uh, which, is a, which is a British uh, sort of popular magazine. But this is the paper I was uh, talking about, uh, the 1999 paper, which I think if you're really interested in this thing, have a look at this, because I think it's a very, very nice paper here, which was uh, published in Foundations of Physics in 1999. And f for me, which covers a lot of groundwork in terms of using uh, quantum mechanics, um, um, to economics and finance. <coughs> and then Olga Shostova uh, did some uh, important work also in, in using specifically a application, a very specific uh, um, interpretation of quantum mechanics, which is Bohmian mechanics. I think uh, there are physicists here, so they, they've all heard about Bohmian mechanics, I'm sure, and you all know that, of course, it's extremely unpopular, I know, among quantum physicists, they don't give a toss about Bohmian mechanics because they say, well, what's the point of using it? But uh, I think uh, it has some mileage, I think, in, uh, in economics and finance. Uh, and uh, Andre, Andre's work and, and Olga's have contributed in that sense uh, to this area. And then, of course, I have some stuff there, too. Um, you, if, if you want to look really at where uh, th those applications of quantum mechanics in finance actually started, probably it's 1999 with the paper of Andrei Andre, uh, Krenikov, but also uh, in, 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 in by work with uh, from um, this gentleman by the name of uh, Segal, who was an MIT professor in maths and who was a supervisor of Edward Nelson, who we had at our quantum interaction uh, conference, uh, and who had this paper here, which in PNAS in 1998. Uh, yes, Segal was Nelson's advisor. Yeah. Very, very old. He died. He died. Segal is dead, actually, now. Yeah. And um, this is a very, very difficult paper for me to understand. So please, if, you, if, if we're in the mood of discussing uh, uh, details, it would be great to have a look at this paper here, because uh, for me, this is a very, very complicated paper. Um, there's some other work by other authors in that field. Um, Schubik, of course, is to be noted. He's also a very old gentleman already, right, uh, from Yale. But he wrote a very short paper on, on uh, basically looking at some sort of uncertainty principle at a, in a macroscopic sense. And um, yeah, that's that. And of course, we can't forget uh, Fabio Bagarello, who actually is getting more and more followers on looking at the operator approach in uh, economics and finance. And he's publishing quite actively in that field now. And it's getting quite a lot of uh, good uh, uh, support, uh, I must say. He had a paper in 2006 in Journal of Physics A, and then uh, also, I, I did not mention, but he also has his new book, which come out, came out uh, with uh, John Wiley. Yeah. Um, <coughs> okay, now, the next thing here I wanted to talk about a little bit is quantum methods in economics and finance. As I said, really, I want to discuss details tomorrow about this. Uh, so I have very little right now in terms of details, but I really, if you would like to come tomorrow, it would really be great because we could then have a good discussion about what uh, we are trying to do, specifically in the area of quantum methods and economics and finance. Um, <coughs> well, we've seen, of course, probability interference in decision-making uh, paradoxes. Um, uh, and um, uh, that was something that uh, Sandra was talking about. But then we also have, uh, in, especially in the area of finance and economics, we're very interested in seeing how we can model information with wave functions in finance and economics. And that has been uh, going through uh, the use of uh, Bohmian mechanics. And I'll give you some of the details definitely tomorrow uh, on this. Um, so it's also a question here is also to be asked about how information is playing a special role in physics. I mean, there's a nice paper by uh, Sheldon Goldstein in Foundations of Physics, um, which specifically asks how information plays a special role in, Bohmian, in a Bohmian universe. I, I, the Bohmian universe is basically telling you that you do, by, by putting in the polar form of a wave function into the Schrodinger equation, right, you actually get... Uh, if you work the whole thing out, you'll get what, what is called in Bohmian mechanics a, a quantum potential, which 
is always a very tricky thing to interpret because uh, at the uh, Leicester conference, uh, Basil Hailey, who right, was the, the main collaborator of David Bohm, uh, is always very careful about how to interpret quantum potential. Is it, is it something which is seen in the same way as a real potential or not? But anyhow, so we'll discuss it uh, uh, tomorrow. But here, uh, this, is, uh, this is a very interesting paper by Goldstein on this, uh, on, on how to interpret uh, information in a Bohmian uh, universe. And um, <coughs> so those are some of the questions he was asking in that paper. Does it merely uh, represent information or does it describe an observer independent reality? If it is objective, does it represent a concrete material sort of... Um, I think I actually cut this off. Right. Right. So there's a lot of things to discuss there, and we will uh, discuss those things tomorrow. So here we have also some other papers here in the area, which I think I want to cite here. This one, I know, uh, I know Sandro is going to say, mm, <laughs> do you want to discuss this one? <laughs> uh, but maybe you want to have a look at it. So I, <laughs> I knew that he would... Uh <laughs> Okay, so and, and you can, if you want to know more about it, uh, in, in the area of finance and economics, please have a look at, at the work by Andre Krenikov and also in, in, in our new, uh, new book. But okay, let me, let me um, right, as I said, more details tomorrow. I, I don't want to de give any de details about it right now. Let us try to answer this question a little bit about how physics actually is now contributing to economics. And as I said at the beginning of this talk here, surely if you look at uh, economics publications, you barely see any publications in economics journals about using physics. Um, right? Right, so. Um, I'm talking here only about economics and finance. I'm not talking about psychology, biology, and so on, which, strangely enough, I think, but maybe we want to discuss, seem to be more open-minded about this. I mean, after all, Journal of Mathematical Psychology is a quite respected journal in the psychology community and has hosted quite a lot of papers in the area. Psychological Science is another one, very famous uh, journal in psychology, which has hosted papers uh, to this topic. Biology is the same. Uh, journal of Theoretical Biology has hosted, uh, Akasio, I think you have a paper in Journal of Theoretical Biology on the topic. In economics, I still have to see it. So, What I was going to mention is that, sure. uh, mention is that in, in psychology, pretty much, the empirical part of psychology started from physicists. So, uh, uh -huh. the interesting. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. I did not know that at all. Okay. So, okay, interesting. Right. Now, I think there are several hurdles, I think, that's my, my, my opinion, uh, you can just uh, put it in the dustbin, whatever you want to do with it, I mean, um, but I think there are several hurdles which uh, we still need to cross before we really can start claiming physics to contribute uh, to a better understanding of economics. And here are some of the issues which I think are not easy to resolve. So the first one is this one here, that we are working with uh, other tools and different expectations. Um, uh, I, I think it's fair to say that, Acasio, please correct me if I'm wrong, if you have experience on, on, on graduate school in economics, typically a graduate student in economics, when he wants to study, say, economic theory, will take courses in measure theory. The, 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 the stock of, of required courses for somebody who wants to really specialize in economic theory per se in graduate school in North America will be please do take a course in measure theory because we are using a lot of measure theory in, in hardcore economic theory. It will be extremely rare that you will see uh, uh, advisors telling their students to take courses in solving PDEs, for instance. It is extremely rare, very, very rare. Right? So there is a culture, I think, uh, in, in graduate schools in North America and also in England that in fact those courses which typically physicists would use as, as their bread and butter kind of uh, um, as their bread and butter courses uh, it, there is a there is a, there is a, a culture in economics that that those type of courses probably would not would not be considered relevant within a typical graduate economics type of uh, training yeah? um, and um, um, 
it's, it's also a problem here because if, if you're going to look at economic theory being the base of a lot of economic modeling, whether it is in public finance, whether it is in monetary theory and so on, then I think you do have a problem here because uh, it, it, you know, it can't penetrate at the base and that that's, I think is, is probably a, a real problem here. Um, uh, the, the other problem you have, and that's something which I was told from the physicist side of things, is that if the problem here also from the physics community is, 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 is a bit peculiar because physicists, uh, the ones at least who work in the area of econophysics, have told me several times that basically they're in fact not so interested to penetrate uh, economic models and try to understand economic models. One of the arguments you very often hear from the physicists in the econophysics community is that basically the assumptions uh, some of the most of the economics models are using are so grandiosely uh, so grandiosely wrong that basically why why are you even bothering about building a model upon upon assumptions which you know are not right and so there's a, I think, I've, I've, that's something I've experienced several times with people from the physics community, especially the physics community, is that they say, well, why do we bother? I mean, we don't want to understand those models. I mean, we, we don't agree with your assumptions you make anyhow. So what we're going to do then basically is just actually not get into your economic models, but we'll try to use our physical techniques to understand an economic problem, which we all can understand, but we don't want to penetrate your models. So of course, if you don't do it, if, if that is happening, then of course, it's, it's, it's very, very difficult because you don't speak the language. Right? So, um, and I can say, for instance, uh, that there are examples of, of very, I mean, um, examples of, 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 of very, very positive spikes uh, where things were really going very, very well, for instance, uh, but, but it, it has died out, I think. But, um, for instance, um, the Santa Fe Institute, right? Santa Fe Institute has hosted... Uh, I think several conferences where there were very, very respected uh, economists participating along very respected physicists okay. on complex systems. I'm not sure what the output has been. I mean, we have had Doyne Farmer over at our university and uh, um, I mean, I couldn't ask him the question, but I'm not sure where, what mileage has, has come out of that. Uh, I mean, when you mention about complex systems, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not so sure whether complex systems is really part and parcel of economics. You see, um, there will there will be certain journal in economics will publish some applications, and there are some uh, some strong groups in in Holland, for instance, uh, in that area. But I'm not sure how much they really uh, publish, and how much also it's part of the mainstream. You see, that's the other thing. Uh, so okay, so there's an issue, an issue of language. There was an issue of of training. Um, uh, uh, here's an example which I think is a neat example on the second law of thermodynamics which is using uh, this, this relationship between um, uh, inexact differentials and, and, and exact differentials on the left hand side on heat and the right hand side on entropy and um, there's a very interesting uh, uh, quote from a book here, I didn't cite it yet, but uh, by, by a book by Peter Richmond who is, who is a noted econophysicist um, which this is a book which appeared with John Wiley, I think. It's, the date is, by the way, wrong. It's not 2013. I think it appeared before. It's 2011, I think, or 12. Um, and heat would then be, of course, in that book. I mean, he mentions here heat would then be translated into money entropy, would be translated into production function, and you would have this, this the uh, the temperature would be uh, seen as a level of GDP. But but what is interesting here in this example is that basically we in economics don't really. Uh, use those ideas of inexact and exact differentials. This is this is stuff which is fairly foreign to us at all. And you see this even at that very basic level here. We are already not really using uh, the same language the physicists are using. Um, <coughs> so that's the first problem. I mean the, the issue of language, the maths language, but also the fact that of course the the cultural attitude towards the discipline is probably quite different between physics and economics. The other, the, the, the second problem is, a, is, a, is even a bigger problem, and that's within the discipline. That is the integration between finance and economics. I told you at the beginning that uh, 73 black and schools came along with their theory, and this was a theory which is explicitly preference-free, which had nothing to do with expected utility. That developed...
very important discipline which is really, really divorced more and more from economics. So it's, I have to tell you this. I mean, uh, in general, it's, it's you know, research in finance is not seen, not, not deemed to be the same as research in, in, in economics. So there's a big divor divorce between the two. There's, there's, a, there's a kind of a, a, a bridging theme which is called financial economics, which is kind of trying to bridge as much as possible economics with finance. But for me, financial economics is much more uh, leaning towards economics than it is actually to, to, towards finance. What is interesting then is that you will see that a lot of people from the physics community have been attracted to finance. Why? Because in black schools, option pricing theory, of course, well, what do they see? If you present black schools, uh, the black schools partial differential equation, everybody will say, oh, well, they see, the physicists see, oh, of course, it's backward Kolmogorov of PDE, right? They see that right away. Of course, uh, guys like, like me don't see that. So right away, they, they, right, they, they, they're getting very happy. They say, oh, we can think around with the volatility parameter. Let's see, can, can we come to, to, to maybe some analytical solution if we make the volatility parameter a little bit more sophisticated or not. But that's typically not the turf of economics people. So you have seen an enormous development in, in this kind of finance, mathematical finance, maybe theoretical finance or mathematical finance, where, where physicists have come in and also mathematicians have come in. I mean, Fields Institute has, for instance, in Toronto, has hosted many, many, many seminars to the field of math finance. Uh, I have one of my PhD students who is going there now for f four or five weeks uh, to work on macroeconomic problems. So, but that's applied maths and, and macroeconomics, which is not this. So, so there's no integration there. Right? There's, uh, the <coughs> And so you don't have an integration within finance and economics, and well, let's see, you have another problem there. Um, <coughs> physical intuition of equivalent economics-based principles is sometimes very hard to come by. Um, if, if you're going to listen, if you're going to read the book by Bilal Baki, for instance, or you read any of his papers, you'll see that, for instance, when he comes to uh, formulate the uh, Hamiltonians, for instance, out of black schools, they are from and he has told him myself, he has told this uh, to, to, to me that, that the physical interpretation of those things are very, very, very hard to come by. Tomorrow I will discuss uh, one of Bilal's papers on his interpretation of supply and demand, very, very basic concept in economics, right? <laughs> Just the equilibrium formulation of supply and demand. And Bilal has a very neat way of looking at it from a potential point of view. And tomorrow I'll discuss that in, in some detail, and, uh, and uh, you'll see there that, that the, the, f the physics interpretation of those things is, is, is quite, quite difficult. And uh, so that's a problem which is actually, I don't know if that's a problem, because you may say, well, we don't really care about that, maybe that's not, not an issue, but I, I mean, you know, okay, what's the added benefit of doing it? If you know you're not going to have any physical intuition to it, then it's not so clear what the added benefit is. Right, so, um, <coughs> right, so this is uh, right. Um, here is, a, is, a, is always a very nice test to see how uh, uh, economics is is actually aware of what has happened. Uh, in, 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 in those contributions. I don't know if you've ever heard by this, this, this work by this person here. Have you ever read? Anybody knows about this gentleman here? So, Georgescu Rügen was a Harvard economist uh, back in the 60s. And he wrote a very, very important book in the 60s on, on, on using entropy in economics. I think if... if uh, I, uh, we should test it, I, I, I don't know, but I mean there's I think there's more economists who do not know him than, than economists who know him. I mean, of course, I can't prove that. But this is, this is a book which, which, which is very, very nice, which was well known in the econophysics community and which has absolutely not made, I think, any imprint within the uh, economics community. And this is dating back from, I think, from the 60s. Um, <coughs> this, is another, this is another work here by this person here, by Louis Bachelier, right? And then, of course, it was also, I mean, Bachelier, I mean, what, what, what you have to know here with, with this thing is that 
when, when option pricing theory was formulated, it was using Brownian motion. But Brownian motion actually was already used in 1900, in 1900, uh, by Louis Bachelet in, in, uh, in his thesis on um, uh, games. He wrote a thesis on games where he was using a Brownian motion, but he, was he wasn't using the right Brownian motion for, for asset prices, because asset prices can't be negative. So Samuelson made later groundwork, and that's a very famous economist who laid the groundwork for using a geometric Brownian motion. But I mean, there's a lot of people in the economics community, I think, who won't have heard of, of Bachelier either. So um, <coughs> um, that has not really uh, penetrated, and that's probably more fuel uh, for despair. But let me just end up with this thing, which is probably even more despairing, and that's 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 a, I think that's that's a very that's a that's a critical point here. Um, I think two years ago there was a gentleman by the name of Perry Merling. Uh, he, he's a he's a history of economics professor at, at Columbia, and um, this is what he said. Before the crisis, that's 2008, uh, 2007, most people thought that efficient markets would be liquid markets because there would always be a buyer willing to step forward when price fell even a little bit below fundamental value. Now, what we have seen in 2008 clearly was that liquidity was not a given anymore. I mean, you really could have a danger of markets drying up right? and stalling. Um, now, in, in economics, we have no models for that. And the strange thing is that if, I think if, I, I've been at conferences just post-2008, and, and I must say, I was very disappointed because when I looked at, at some of the, I mean, some of the big people presenting at some of those conferences, they were not that concerned about that. And that worries me. Because this is a very, very major event which a lot of our models absolutely couldn't predict. And there seems to be not a big amount of concern in the economics community to actually deal with this. And that, that concerns me tremendously, I must say. Um, um, if you see, for instance, how we in economics deal with extreme events, then basically we have virtually nothing out there. But there is a lot out there in the literature, in the extreme uh, uh, value literature, in applied maths, for instance, which deals with it, but it is not penetrating into economics at all. Um, and that's <laughs> a little bit problematic. I think physics could certainly help there also. Um, but again, if it's not going to get published in the economics journals, then probably it will uh, probably not uh, do much to explain uh, the new crisis. So that's kind of what I wanted to say. And uh, I think th the last point I think is really important uh, because that is something I experienced. That is that if you look post-2008 and you really make the valid challenge that, okay, look, listen, model-wise, what do you want to do now? How do you include, for instance, liquidity in your models? Then I must say now, right now, talking right now, I don't think there's much out there in terms of published papers and very good economic journals which deal with that problem, which kind of worries me tremendously, I must say. So tomorrow I'm going to talk much more about details about how quantum mechanical ideas can penetrate into finance and economics. And I'll start out with uh, some of the ideas of Belal Baki using just very basic uh, statistical mechanics and then go over a little bit into uh, quantum mechanics. So that's kind of where I want to end. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, no, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry, yeah, just please. I'd like to thank again Professor Haven for having joined us and for, the, for this brief introduction to tomorrow's lectures. And okay, I'd also thank the, both the speakers for joining. Uh, I will now switch to, say, uh, a question session with a kind of a round table. So I will invite also Dr. Sozzo to, to, join, uh, to join the table in the discussion. And probably the, the most convenient thing is to split the two microphones. So I will leave one microphone for all of the speakers on, on the table. Professor De Barosh, if you also if you also want to join them uh, in, in answering the questions and commenting to the audience questions, uh, feel free as you like. And, and instead, I will just move the yeah, I will just move the, the other microphone in the audience for the for the sake of all those who, who want to, to ask questions. And just to, to add a brief presentation of the audience, given that we have we have a small one, uh, I will just briefly comment that uh, there are some colleagues of mine from the Department of Innovative Engineering. 
uh, some people, so students, some PhD students, and one professor from the, from the physics faculty. So that's basically the, the composition of the audience. Well, I am a physicist myself as a background, and now at, uh, at the time I do collaborate with the Department of Innovation Engineering. Plus, I'm kind of a startupper. So this is the, the composition of the audience. Quale microfono posso lasciare a loro? Quello funziona abbastanza bene. E lo puoi lasciare volante e, e se lo passano, esatto, oppure... Sì, era per far passare il gelato nel, nel pubblico. Ok. Fai un attimo una prova, magari, per controllare che funzioni. Adesso sì? Ok. Perfetto. Ok, okay so, time's open for questions. Are you joining or will you... Ok, ok, great. So, questions? I want to make a comment. Ok, yeah. Mentor, he left a big name out of this. Sorry, it's just, it's just a quick comment about the uh, influence of physicists in the uh, economy. You left a big name out of it, which is Newton. Uh, the Bank of England was created, and he was the first uh, 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 president of the B Bank of England because of his tremendous importance at the time. And, uh, uh, of no, course... Yes. Very nasty tax yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Very nasty tax collector. Yeah. But uh, 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 physics uh, has had a tremendous uh, influence intellectually uh, in all of the social sciences. Uh, Weber uh, was uh, uh, influenced by physics um, as well as Durkheim. So we have uh, all those uh, 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 very important at the beginning of those uh, 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 fields uh, influences uh, from physics and. Uh, I just wanted to make a, make a comment about that. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, that's a total, total agreement uh, with you, Akasu, absolutely. Uh, unfortunately, I think, uh, in, I think in graduate training of economics nowadays, I don't think, unless you want to really go into the history of economics, you will of course look at this work, but I, I doubt very much that in typical graduate training now in economics, in microeconomic theory, macroeconomics, public finance, that you really will go into this, I, I doubt that. And I, there's, also probably also a re there's also a very pragmatic reason for that, because basically you have a very short period of time where you have to get the technicalities out of the way with, with the new models, and I don't think there's much time for that. I think, certainly when I was studying in Canada, basically we had no time for that at all, ex except if you wanted to go into the history of economics. But I totally agree with you, those are important people who sourced a lot of... Uh, So use the, the microphone on the table. It should work. Yeah. You you had a question for Sandro. Mm -hmm. First of all, so Sandro, uh, when you talk about the um, uh, concepts, uh, mo the modeling of concepts according to quantum theory, uh, I was wondering: uh, is there any way to represent the process of uh, neuroplasticity, which is uh, an outstanding problem in uh, current research on uh, the brain functioning? I the the way that. Uh, uh, connections in the brain change with uh, with time uh, through um, some specific ex exercises and so on. So you know, when I think of quantum mechanics and problems in quantum mechanics, I think that there is a, br a broad range of probabilities which are fixed in time. You can do experiments, uh, and uh, if you do enough experiments, enough tries, uh, get some results which are uh, fixed given uh, the conditions of, for, for the system. The potential it is subjected to. But in, in, uh, in the behavioral sciences, as far as I know, there is the possibility that uh, the system evolves, um, uh, gets, uh, so undergoes an evolution in, uh, in time. So I guess uh, this should be kind of uh, evolution in the connection, the inter in the interplay between different concepts. Is there any way to model these uh, processes? So, uh, can you hear me? Okay, but, but I don't think it's work. Uh, is, is it working? So, yes, I, I know very little about uh, about the the application of the formalism of quantum mechanics to to the human brain. I know that some steps uh, have been done. Uh, in particular, uh, there there are 
two important results. One of them, it, it was showed probably by Harald, Harald atman Spacher, that uh, it is possible to, to violate in the human brain uh, a specific version of legat garg inequality of belts inequalities that are called legat garg for system that uh, that evolve in time and uh, uh, there this violation would suggest that uh, that you have some some entangled connections in uh, in in different parts of the brain uh, I don't think you can uh, uh, you can directly infer uh, uh, the presence of quantum structures uh, in uh, in the brain from our research and concept combination. Uh, but I'm not an expert in this uh, from from this point of view because uh, there is one thing is that our model is descriptive model. So you collect a set of experimental data and uh, you try to fit this data by by the best model you can. And uh, in this sense, uh, I could say that you are using uh, quantum mathematics, not quantum physics. Okay? So you are using uh, a Hilbert space machinery, Hilbert space framework, uh, and so on. So you cannot infer anything about that. But recently, and uh, this is the second uh, discovery I was informed about, uh, it was found, and uh, this, uh, th there was a, uh, an experimental paper p published on Nature of some, uh, ne I, I think they were neurologists, who, who showed that the, um, the, the, the cortical fiber pathways are very simple structures in the sense that uh, uh, the connections between the electric parts of the, of the brain are very simple and are localized along uh, very specific layered uh, structures. So this means that the connections in the human brain are much more simpler than expected. And this, from the point of view of the human brain, would put at stake the neural network paradigm, for example according to which uh, the idea is that the, the brain is the hardware and the mind is a program carried out by the brain. Uh, and this uh, would give rise to the fact that probably you have much more potentiality involved in the human brain. So connections are not, uh, are, uh, not created, each, uh, each, uh, are created each time they are needed, but uh, they are not uh, concretely present in the human brain. I don't know whether I am unclear. This is the same, from the mathematical point of view, the best way to discuss this is by using a linear vector structure, in which uh, you, have that, uh, you have a basis of eigenvectors, no? on which you construct all the vectors, but these are constructed only when they are needed. In this sense, uh, the, neural ne uh, the neural network paradigm would be uh, s too complex and not necessary for the description of the human brain. In this sense, uh, uh, an insight toward quantum would be possible. But this is the only thing I can infer from uh, my research on, this, on these topics and these aspects. Thank you so much. Yes. Yeah, I, I just want to make a quick comment on that, uh, which is um, I have a paper actually last year that I published on uh, biosystems, where I show that uh, if you if you look at collective behavior of uh, neurons, and uh, in fact this is something that can easily be proved, if if you have a collective behavior of neurons, then you have uh, wave-like propagations on the neocortex, and because you have those wave-like propagations, you have interference classical interference, uh, similar to what you have in terms of wave interferences or, uh, you know, any kind of like a wave interference, right? And because you have those classical interferences, you have contextuality uh, in firing of neurons in the neocortex. And that contextuality is akin to having what some people call quantum-like effects. Uh, um, they're not actually quantum effects in the same way that physicists think of quantum effects, but they have those contextual quantum effects that we think about when we're talking about any of those models that we see here. And uh, uh, in, in that sense, we should take like violations of Bell's inequalities of a grain of salt. What violations of Bell's inequalities are telling us is that you don't have a joint probability distribution. But in many of those cases, particularly in uh, uh, the social sciences, 
you have violation of marginal selectivity to begin with, so of course you don't even have the basic assumption of Bell's inequalities, which is that you have a joint probability distribution to begin with. But uh, 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 in the model that I talk about in biosystems, and I can give you the reference if you want, um, what I show is that you can have a, a learning model uh, so you start with a collection of uh, uh, neurons and you have neuroplasticity, of course, and you have learning in it. Uh, and you have a, 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 that neural model that has learning and at the same time has, is complex enough that you get interference. And because you get interference, you have quantum-like effects and therefore you have violation of uh, 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 standard probability uh, 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 theory because you have uh, uh, this uh, interference kind of effect. So it's, it's, yes? This, those waves are you mentioned on the neurons or a collection of set of neurons are waves of what? Uh, waves of, uh, so it's, yeah. What's the meaning? So the meaning of the waves is just waves of firing rates. So you have uh, a bunch of neurons that are firing and they fire in synchronously, uh, synchronously. So there's synchronicity in the firing. And uh, neurons that are firing, uh, say, in one place in the cortex uh, have uh, 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 an influence in the firing of other neurons in another place of the, uh, the cortex. And you have this propagation of synchronicity. So it's a wave of synchronicity. Uh, am I making sense? Uh, yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. It's not a electromagnetic wave. No, no, it's a, it's a synchronicity. It, it, it's, so each neuron fires uh, uh, periodically. So you can think of uh, uh, a neuron, for example, firing periodically as an uh, under hop uh, uh, kind of bifurcation, a neuron close to a bifurcation, and then it has a periodic firing. And because you have many neurons uh, weakly connected, those guys tend to fire synchronously. So if you have a bunch of neurons firing synchronously with another one. And that synchronicity moves on the cortex. And when that synchronicity moves in the cortex, it moves like a wave because they're firing synchronously. So yeah. So it, it, it's not a, a, a classical electromagnetic wave or anything like that. It's a firing wave in a certain sense. And, and you can actually see very... Uh, Yeah, it's a wave of the firing of individual neurons, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, in some senses, uh, we can interpret as a sort of amplitude or of, of probability to be in a state or in a different state. To be for each similar uh, neurons or something like that. To be in a, size, in a certain point of the size of it or, or not. In the face of your, in the face of your, of the, Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in fact, you can make it formally uh, equivalent to a phase oscillator. So if you think about an oscillator, and you think about two different oscillators, right? So the uh, characteristic of oscillators is that they have an amplitude and they have a phase. And in those cases, because what really matters is the uh, timing of the firing, because a neuron has a, a fixed amplitude of uh, firing, right? So it, what really matters is the timing of the firing then you can focus uh, simply on the phase of the oscillations because the amplitude is irrelevant in this case. Mm -hmm. And then you have those uh, phase oscillators uh, uh, related in, in this uh, 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 time-like uh, kind of, not time-like is the wrong expression here, but uh, time fashion, right, in uh, synchronicity fashion. And then when you have those phase oscillators, they propagate on the neocortex. And then you have interference of those oscillators, and you can show that you have interference of those. And in fact, you can observe them on the uh, cortex of uh, rats, for example, or in uh, simulations that you can make on the neocortex. So I think that there is a very uh, strong neuro basis uh, for uh, quantum effects in the brain that comes not from quantum mechanics at all, but comes from uh, uh, basic uh, uh, classical interference. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, Andrea, may I make uh, two brief comments on, uh, on, on this discussion? Uh, the, the, I, I will start from, from the last one, from, from your remark. And uh, this is quite interesting from a sociological point of view, because uh, uh, 
uh, I come from the foundations of quantum mechanics. Uh, so my background is in the foundations of quantum mechanics. Uh, and then uh, the, the general uh, aim, what we, we would like to do is uh, applying uh, quantum structures outside physics uh, to get some uh, insights back, uh, some feedback uh, toward the, uh, again, the foundations of quantum mechanics. In the sense, we, we study how entanglement, uh, contextuality, quantum probability, and so on, uh, can be applied outside physics uh, to get some information uh, how to clarify these aspects uh, that are in some cases still puzzling, uh, even from the point of view of the, of the foundations of quantum theory. So, and uh, this is interesting. Uh, uh, th there is a funny story that uh, that occurred to to our to, to my group in Brussels uh, that we had with uh, with a known uh, psychologist, uh, with Itabar Zafarov, and uh, uh, and uh, it is about the um, the experiment we performed in, in which we violated the Bell's inequalities uh, 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 with uh, a combination of concepts in a cognitive experiment. So one typically says in quantum mechanics, okay, you, you have a set of experimental data, you violate Bell's inequalities, uh, this is uh, sufficient for you to, uh, to infer that uh, a Kolmogorovian probability model, a classical probability model, does not exist. And this is the first hint to say, okay, we have something non-classical, we have something quantum, and so on. And... Uh, the, f the most important fact is that in quantum mechanics, uh, the marginal law is not violated. A and uh, what, what he called the marginal selectivity is not violated. While most of experimental data in cognitive science violate this marginal, uh, marginal selectivity. And uh, uh, this psychologist uh, suggested an alternative explanation of uh, any set of experimental data violating Bell's inequalities uh, in terms of classical communication. You have uh, Kolmogorovian spaces and classical communication uh, that reproduce uh, the, same, uh, the same statistical correlations, the experimental correlations. And so uh, uh, he wrote a commentary on our paper in which he said uh, uh, that, yes, you, you are using uh, Bell's inequalities. Uh, your, your violation of Bell's inequality is, is, is not conclusive about the presence of entanglement in your set of experimental data and for your concepts. Then we constructed an explicit model in complex Hilbert space to show that generally, uh, of course, in our experimental data, the marginal selectivity was, uh, was uh, violated. So thi this was the main problem. And uh, so we worked out a quantum model in complex Hilbert space in which we showed that uh, after this uh, analysis, a stronger form of entanglement appears in which not only the state of the concepts is entangled, but also the, uh, the, the measurements that are performed are entangled. But this result was possible only through the collaboration with a psychologist who suggested as uh, something that uh, in the psychological field uh, is well known, uh, a set of experimental data that violates the marginal selectivity or the marginal probability distribution and so on. So this was uh, uh, something that was on the borderline between physics and psychology and uh, it was the interaction between different groups which allowed to to better to to provide a better understanding of things, the second aspect uh, that I would like to to point out uh, has to do with the fact uh, that uh, there is no ov overlapping uh, and interaction between uh, physicists and economists. And uh, one of the reasons, uh, could but this is also present in psychologists. Uh, is the fact that uh, it is difficult, the, the uh, uh, models uh, are provided, theoretical models are provided, uh, are worked out uh, to model a set of experimental data in a di with a different purpose, with a different aim. We could say by using uh, uh, the terminology with which is typical of physicists uh, that uh, uh, the models employed outside physics are ad hoc models in the sense that you have a set of experimental data and you look for the, be the model, the, the theoretical, the mathematical model, which provides, which fits the data with the, uh, the lowest number of parameters. 
Okay? The less parameters you, you have, the better is uh, your model and more predictive is according to psychologists uh, and economists uh, your model. Of course, in physics it is the other way around because uh, uh, if you think to quantum theory, you want to provide the most general uh, model and uh, you would like to have uh, so many parameters uh, uh, so many parameters that you can reproduce all experimental data collected in the same, in the same field. And so, uh, <laughs> yes, for example, if you think to Newtonian mechanics or uh, to quantum th physics, uh, you have uh, uh, a number of parameters which is enough to reproduce all existing phenomena on this topic. Uh, while in the psychological, uh, uh, people coming uh, from uh, psychology, so with a psychological background, with an economical background, uh, think in a different way. And so this is one of the main objections uh, a physicist find uh, when trying to publish on these papers. So your, the number of parameters versus the number of experimental data is too high. So the model is, not, uh, is descriptive, but not, uh, ex uh, it has not explanatory power. Yes. Yeah, it's. Uh, it, well, you are saying is true, but um, the point is that in physics, well, let us take um, many well-known examples, is to include into your model. Uh, less number as possible of constant or parameter, you want to create, uh, I don't know, um, general relativity, it's enough, one constant. You want to generate a standard model of particles. Uh, and there, there are too many, and people are looking around. One of the motivation of the, of the search for X boson is to eliminate a certain number of fine-tuned parameters. And this is the aim of most of physics. And the basic, uh, the, ba the uh, basical ideas in physics one f on one side is to use, for instance, uh, a priori very general geometric ideas like I want that my theory satisfies some symmetries. I probably this is not true in, a, in, a, in any social science. There is no a, a general uh, sym symmetry uh, you, can, uh, you can use or you can uh, postulate or uh, in some. So, of course, of course if you have uh, um, a specific problem in, in physics, of course, you, you, tune the fi you have a fine tuning of the parameters for a special problem, but not for the general problem. And this makes the difference. One, in biology, I know a little bit more about biology than in social sciences. The problem of theoretical biology is that there is no uh, laws general enough like Newton principles, just to say the simple thing. They cannot write F equal to MA, but, and then, after you specify F. Uh, yeah, this, I think this is a, one of the main problems of the, how to say, the historical science, in the sense that uh, science like biology uh, depends strictly from the concrete evolution of uh, what really happened at a certain time in, in the history of, uh, of the uh, living living uh, bodies, and this is more or less for social sciences, I, I assume. This, is, this makes the, the big difference between, uh, and, and also difficulties in communicating between different kind, uh, social science or bio historical, uh, with quotation marks, sciences and uh, mathematics and physics, this, or chemistry. Uh, this is makes, uh, from my opinion, let's say, very peculiar, very personal, uh, uh, the, the, the main difference. You, uh, and, uh, and then you need, uh, in one case, uh, in, in social science or um, specific, very specific models, and you can apply in 
of course, with the less uh, number um, of parameters, because you want co control. But you, well, uh, if you add parameters, uh, you, you can describe maybe uh, more uh, type of uh, class or larger, a larger class of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of systems closer. Uh, tigers and uh, jaguars are belongs to the same family, but uh, one they have stri strips and the others just different kind of of, of um, uh, yeah. Uh, if you want describe at the same time uh, the same class, these two classes of of animals, you need a larger model. And this makes the different, uh, big difference. Of course, from from point of view of physics, this doesn't make much sense. I mean, it's tigers and jaguar you can you can describe with, with only one model, and uh, if if it makes sense. I mean, this this kind of um, uh, this, may, uh, in my opinion, is a big difference. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's, it's just a remark on the same uh, kinds of things that uh, he, was, uh, he was talking about from the point of view of psychology. So uh, um, I, uh, I have a paper that we published, I think, in uh, 2011 in the Journal of Mathematical Psychology, where we uh, uh, construct a uh, neuro uh, uh, oscillator model of stimulus response theory. And uh, uh, one of the things that we have is a lot of uh, parameters, because, of course, it's a model that's grounded on uh, neurophysiological uh, data. So when you're trying to do something that has an underlying theory behind it, psychologists can uh, sort of like accept the many, many different parameters because they understand that it comes from uh, 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 some other theory. But they're overall uh, skeptic uh, of that kind of model because of exactly having so many parameters. And one of the things that you know is that if you have lots of parameters, you can fit anything. Mm -hmm. And therefore, your theory becomes a, a very uninteresting theory because anything you want can be fitted within your theory. And uh, because you can fit anything, it loses sort of like that predictability, uh, a power of predicting interesting things in, in a very Popperian sense of predictability that we're thinking about of like sticking your neck out and making predictions that nobody can, uh, 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 un unexpected predictions, right? And. Uh, 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 but that comes from them uh, studying, as uh, Emmanuel mentioned, uh, 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 measure theory. They understand that uh, uh, if you have too many free parameters, you can fit anything to your theory. And perhaps there is something to be learned from physicists uh, 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 with that respect, because we have, for example, a string theory that can predict anything, and uh, uh, psychologists would be very skeptical of such theory, and perhaps yeah, yeah. physicists should be. But uh, anyway, so it's just like a general remark of, where it comes from in psychology. And I'm, I'm sure in, the, uh, 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 in other social sciences like economy. Yes, but uh, I, I agree because this is the same experience I had. But uh, uh, sorry, Gigi, do, do you uh, agree with me that uh, in, in quantum theory you have so many parameters that uh, allow you to describe uh, a general kind of, uh, of phenomena in terms, in terms of the same formalism and of the same model? Let us call it the Hilbertian model. Hilbert model. You don't have to change the specific model uh, if you change, for example, uh, if you change the particle, the phenomenon, and so on. So you have that the formalism is general enough to uh, encompass a, a broad variety of, of uh, situations and particles. This is not the aim of people who are coming from the social, the, the first aim of people coming from the social science. The first reason is that they don't have the question of motion, of course. With respect, art sciences have, uh, or physics has, has this, okay? But uh, in this way, if you change the specific model by change uh, with the change of experimental data, then uh, you 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 will not be able to find uh, the general law that is common to uh, different classes of phenomena. This is the problem. So if you are in this perspective, uh, you will be never be able. Uh, to, to say that, for example, uh, the, the broad quantum formalism, the, the whole quantum formalism, uh, can model uh, uh, your set of experimental data. Because uh, there, there are just too many parameters. I, I know, I know. 
So the idea is that I would like to, to have a theory, a model, that has uh, so many parameters uh, that can model uh, different sets of experimental data coming from different perspectives and from different uh, studies from different scholars. What we did with our quantum modeling is just this, for example. It was uh, constructed to fit uh, Hampton's data on the conjunction and disjunction of two concepts. Then we magically found that uh, it had uh, so many parameters that it could also describe in the same way, so with the same explanatory hypothesis, uh, the data came from a different set. Uh, they were collected by Alksati and Pelletier and are about the the conjunction of a concept and its negation. These are the so-called borderline contradictions. And also in this case, uh, you don't have a psychological theory that can explain them, but they have the same explanation that we gave for the case of Hampton. This is just an application to a special case where we have a concept A and the concept B, which is just the negation of A. So our ge model was general enough uh, to, to cope with such kind of experimental data too, with the same explanatory hypothesis, the, the, the two-layered structure of human thought. I, I'd like to, to make a small uh, comment, uh, Sandro, on, on, of course, the experiments I know about Hampton and, and your formulation about it. Um, you also talked at the beginning of your talk about uh, non boolean logic and quantum mechanics and so on. So, of course, we all know that fuzzy logic, Lukasiewicz lo logic and so on, was actually, is, is also uh, part of, of, of the type of quantum logic one uses, right, or, or not. And then my next question is, if you look at the results you've had, for instance, now with the reinterpretation of Hampton results, where is fuzzy set theory coming in, in terms of using membership degrees and using T norms and T co norms for the conjunctions, disjunctions? Are those still usable as an alternative way of explaining things? No, Not at all. No, okay. yes. no, no thi this was uh, uh, showed uh, probably by the Zadeh, the same, uh, that uh, you can uh, extend uh, the conjunctions uh, and uh, the, the disjunction, the, the definition, <laughs> with the different kind of operators. Uh, typically, it is uh, the maximum rule for the case of disjunction and yeah, the, the, the minimum rule for the case of the conjunction. But uh, even, uh, in in that case, uh, even in that case, uh, you have that the set of experimental data collected by Hampton cannot be explained by a fuzzy set underlying structure. No, 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 we showed that, uh, this is all family, right? yes, I, I know that there are different families, but they, they use the, 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 most, the most used one, and in this case, uh, it, it is rigorous to prove, you can prove rigorously that it does not work. But there is the general opinion, even uh, among uh, psychologists, uh, that uh, the problem is not uh, the kind of connectives uh, you decide to use uh, to represent the combinations, but it is the general idea that uh, uh, concepts are containers, are sets. And if you consider fuzzy set, it is a set. Of course, with a graded membership, but it is a, a, a set. And uh, it is uh, the difference. So in this perspective, I would say that the fuzzy set approach is a classical approach. It's a classical approach in the sense that uh, it still considers uh, a concept as a container of instantiations. And uh, our approach, which, which is quantum, has this big difference that uh, a, the an item, an instance, is just a state of a conceptual entity. And so you cannot use uh, a set of theoretic formalism, but uh, you have to use a more structured formalism in which uh, you use a linear vector space and so on. Another interesting aspect uh, is that uh, even if uh, you use quantum logic to represent uh, the set of experimental data collected by Hampton, so even if you associate uh, the, the concept uh, not by a set but by, for example, a subspace uh, of a linear space uh, as it is done uh, in, uh, in standard quantum logic uh, and you try to represent uh, the conjunction in terms of uh, the, the conjunction, the meet of subspaces uh, and the disjunction in terms of the linear sum of subspaces, uh, it does not work. 
So it's not proper quantum logic that models the set of experimental data collected by Hampton. And indeed, uh, this is the next step uh, we would like to, uh, to find, uh, in the sense that uh, our model is descriptive in the sense that it just provides, uh, well, a description of uh, experimental data. If you want, uh, yes, if you want to find uh, the, the normative counterpart, uh, looking for the underlying truth theory, of uh, these uh, combination processes, uh, this is a problem because it is not fuzzy logic, it is neither quantum logic. Uh, can, can I make a comment on that? Uh, I want to express my skepticism about what you said because uh, um, uh, when, when you're saying that, uh, what you're saying is that you can't use the same probability space to describe those things. But you can always extend your probability states so, for example, uh, uh, um, with the famous uh, cases that you talked about, uh, 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 ju just to uh, uh, fixate on one, um, you get the uh, 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 conjunction paradox, right? Uh, Linda is a bank teller, or Linda is a bank teller, and she's an active feminist. Um, I, I can, uh, I can uh, have each one of those questions in different probability spaces and just say that uh, statements a is uh, uh, contextually different from statement B, and they're in separate probability spaces, and I can then construct a whole uh, measure theoretic uh, uh, space for a uh, statement A and a measure theoretic sta state for uh, 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 statement B, and uh, you'd have a classic description of that. Uh, so I have no problem with that, uh, 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 with a classic description. Uh, all you do is extend the uh, probability states, uh, 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 spaces, and therefore you have a Komogorovian space. The difficulty comes when we uh, uh, say that we're talking about the same elements of that probability space. So just to go back to quantum mechanics, for example, um, uh, you would have no problem with uh, momentum uh, uh, and space as uh, uh, being uh, 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 something that has a joint probability measure. The difficulty comes from saying that momentum uh, when I measure position first, is the same as momentum when I don't measure position first. And of course, that opens a whole new can of worms, but, but it's important to uh, 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 um, recognize that uh, such things can be done. It's just that there is a very tricky underlying assumption coming from it, which is that they are the same thing. And uh, uh, it, it leaks in, so that's uh, just the comment that I wanted to make. No, I agree with you, and uh, I know that when one typically says, okay, you have a system in which, which violates Bell's inequalities, then uh, you cannot describe everything in a single probability space, Kolmogorovian probability space. But uh, you can have two different Kolmogorovian probability space describing this, uh, these situations. What is the advantage of using a quantum structure is uh, that you have uh, the easiest way to pass from one to connect uh, these two probability spaces. And in this sense, uh, it would provide you a, a unified solution in this sense. But of course, yes, there is this underlying assumption that uh, should be said. This is not impossible, uh, but uh, uh, there are different Kolmogorovian space. But if you use a unique non-Kolmogorovian quantum probability space, uh, you can connect uh, these different Kolmogorovian spaces and quantum probability knows how to do. I would like to, to perform a further question, which I think still draws on this line, but say from a different point of view. To whom? Oh, well, it's a general collective question, so ah, to say. Okay. So, so feel ask. free to answer whatever, <laughs> whoever of you who thinks to, thinks to fix it more uh, in his experience, researches, and so on. So one thing which made me mm, definitely curious about it uh, is, okay, uh, if you think, for example, about, say, classical approach to probability, uh, well, before being definitely and in a proper manner formalized by Kolmogorov works and, uh, and subsequent ones, uh, it had already, you know, been uh, being used quite a lot in game theory and so on, and it was considered as a rational logic approach by most of the people working with that kind of approach, right? So that should uh, make the premise, okay, 
some parts of our mind at least seem to work classically, right? And then in some sets of experiments, uh, you start to crack it down and you find out that actually it isn't enough to, to explain everything and you find out this um, emergence of, let's call it quantum-like phenomena. Now, uh, the problem will be, uh, it has been a rich, a very rich border in conclusions and activity in, uh, in say, traditional physics, the, the transition between the, the classical world and the quantum realm. And okay, up to now actually we have no clear idea of uh, how really this transition works, but of course you, you can still make some, some assumptions in at least a few, a few specific cases where you, for example, build the semi-classical models and, uh, and you pick up, for example, the Planck's constant to one and so on, or for example, you, uh, you do have in, uh, in solid state theories, okay, uh, you do have lots of states and those draw to the continuum and you do not anymore observe any, uh, any quantum gaps between, uh, between the levels and so on. So actually all this transition thing, uh, would you expect it to come out also in, uh, in this sector or maybe you do have both, say, the, the classical reasoning and the quantum realm reasoning both embedded in the, in the same, almost the same situations. So instead of already giving you the, the, the most difficult questions, if you want to, to take it from this, from this point of view, uh, okay, is, can it be uh, your model predictive on some results of experiments? So for example, can you reduce the, the number of parameters to be used? I would rather uh, start to ask, okay, can, uh, can your model, can uh, any theory which is maybe starting to, uh, to emerge be predictive of in which experiments cognitive or uh, say economical situation you do expect to exploit quantum, uh, this quantum-like effects and in which you, already, uh, you instead expect for sure a classical behavior before performing any experiment? And that's, the, that's the question. From, uh, I mean, just from economics finance point of view, the answer to this question would, would assume that you, you have already quite a, a, an achieved uh, set of knowledge in that field. And I, I think at this point in economics and finance, I think um, it's much more at the ad hoc quantum-like type of thing, stage. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I, I would be very hard pressed to see. Uh, I, no, I wouldn't be able to give you an answer uh, because it, it, it subsumes that we have already advanced quite a lot in, in, in what, especially at the, in, in the applications in, in economics and finance. It's, uh, and I don't think we have, I think there's a lot of work which has been done in terms of trying to model information with wave functions and then you don't even know whether this is actually quantum mechanical or not. Mm -hmm. um, but but uh, at an experimental level certainly, I don't know of anything for sure which has been done. Uh, okay. But of course, what Sandro's work and, and Acasio's work is doing is, of course, since of course it is tying in with decision making, it in some sense connects with. It it could connect with what we do in in terms of decision making economics, but that certainly hasn't happened yet at all, right? And but I, I have to say that uh, I I actually don't know whether the problem of the quantum classical transition has been settled once for all in in physics. Because, well, uh, you, you actually have so many uh, attempts to, to solve this problem, but they, there is no uh, a uniform uh, opinion in scientific community. Uh, we actually, uh, in some cases, we know how you have, uh, if you have a stone, and if you throw a stone, it follows the the laws of Newton, while uh, each particle follows the law or the, uh, the equation of motion of Schrodinger. You have some uh, large number of classical limits of quantum mechanics, but uh, they are not the same. And even in the measurement process, you have the coherence uh, and so on, but uh, well, they are some, some approaches, but the, the quantum classical transition at the best of my knowledge, is an open problem, even if uh, it, the, the loophole is closed in some cases. Concerning the difference between uh, uh, classical and, uh, uh, and quantum probability, that uh, so the violation of uh, Kolmogorovian probability in the decision processes, uh, 
we f we found that this is uh, a result that comes from the foundations of quantum theory and it is the connection existing between uh, the type of probability model uh, you use uh, and uh, the degree of contextuality of your system so you can have s a system any kind of system it can be a physical uh, a co uh, it can be a cognitive uh, and so any kind of system for which, uh, if, uh, if in, in this uh, system you can uh, uh, manipulate the interaction with the environment in such a way that uh, this can be modeled, for example, in terms of a potential, okay? So you can turn on and turn off the interaction with the outside world. So this means that the contextuality is reduced to the minimum, or, I or if it is a controllable contextuality, then uh, the probability model that uh, you can use is Kolmogorovian. <coughs> okay? You, you just need one Kolmogorovian probability model. And uh, this is one typically occurs in classical physics, for example. But if you have a system which can interact with an environment, with a context, in a way that cannot be neither controlled nor predicted, okay, then uh, the, uh, you cannot express all these in a unique Kolmogorovian probability model. And then you have an int to say that in that case, you have the model you need is uh, at least a non Kolmogorovian. In some cases, there is a specific non Kolmogorovian model which applies, uh, and it is the quantum, the quantum model. In the case of concept combination, uh, we notice uh, that the following. Classical logical uh, reasoning, so our classical way of combining concepts, uh, is connected with, uh, also in this case, with uh, the context, but in a very specific way. If you consider, for example, apple, no, and you wonder whether it is a fruit or a vegetable, okay, you know that most of the answer will respect the classical rules, in the sense that the membership weights can be expressed in a Kolmogorovian framework. Okay, just because uh, you know that it is definitely not a vegetable and it is definitely a fruit. So you can uh, construct the membership weight with respect, for example, to the, to the conjunction by following uh, classical rules. The problem is that you have uh, many other exemplars uh, for which uh, you don't know at the best of your knowledge whether it is a fruit or a vegetable. And then uh, you are uh, drastically influenced by the context in such a way that uh, you start uh, to think that uh, this uh, is a very good exemplar of uh, a, a new concept, which is the concept for which uh, you are answering. So you consider it uh, a, a good exemplar, for example, of tomato, this is, uh, this is quite typical, no? this, is, this is easy, the answer. Okay, one does not know whether it is a fruit or a vegetable, then uh, it starts to think that probably it is, uh, it is definitely the disjunction, for example, because uh, you are uh, asked about the disjunction, so you are contextually influenced by inter the interviewer. Okay, so in this specific case, uh, we, can, we can show these extremal phenomena, it is, it is easy to see whether you need uh, a, a pure classical or a pure quantum model. Yeah. But I guess you probably want to tell yeah, something just about to this. to briefly point out, of course, I, uh, I already mentioned, okay, it's an open question, say, to explain the transition, so I was already aware of that. And I wasn't asking you, of course, okay, in, in your model now explain the transition between the classical thing and, and the quantum realm. So to, to come to your example, it was just, okay, whenever you, you throw a stone and you want to model it, you will never start with the Schrodinger equation, right? So that was the, 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 the idea, okay, so when would you expect to use one or the other formula? So I'm okay with the answer. Yeah. Let me make a quick comment. Do you want then. to object something? Uh, of course. Uh, yes, please. So, so <laughs> please actually, continue. Uh, actually, I'm going to agree with uh, Sandra this time <laughs> 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 to object to his uh, concern about me objecting. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But uh, yeah, it's a very interesting question. And I think that uh, I, I sort of like have the same uh, answer as uh, uh, Sandra because I see those quantum-like uh, phenomena is coming out of contextuality, right? And uh, when you think about uh, most things, they are contextual. And uh, 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 the, the answer to your question would be that uh, when you're looking at social phenomena, 
I would expect to find most of them as being contextual and therefore being quantum-like. And it's not uh, uh, until you go to the very controlled uh, experimental setup in a lab in, in the social sciences that you might find answers that are not contextual, but I think that everywhere you're going to find uh, answers that are contextual. And in fact, I think that uh, in, in most of the uh, practical cases, you're going to find answers that are so contextual that you're not going to even have a hope of having a, 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 a joint probability distribution because you're going to have clear-cut violations of marginal selectivity like we talked, and you're going to have clear-cut uh, uh, cases where you have uh, 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 many, many different, uh, 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 he, um, not Hilbert uh, uh, Komogorov uh, measure spaces. And uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, your quantum description is going to have to be extended to, to, to have many also different Hilbert spaces uh, in those cases because you get to a very complicated situations that are very, very highly contextual. So I think that it's much messier than uh, uh, one might want it to be, but that's, that's the way things are. And, and, uh, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about that, but uh, one of the things that we, uh, tomorrow, sorry, Today I'm already talking about that. But uh, I, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that tomorrow. But one of the things that we have is uh, uh, um, the ability as human beings of sort of like abstracting all those contexts and uh, uh, um, being able to actually make rational decisions by uh, uh, saying that all those contexts that we have around us are not important. Whereas, uh, 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 Evolutionary, we sort of like have this uh, uh, computational devices that we use that do not abstract those contexts and uh, sort of like make that, those decisions context-based in that sense. And that's, that's where those parado paradoxes uh, come from. Is we have this very quick, very uh, uh, useful way to compute things uh, and make decisions that come from this uh, 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 context-dependent uh, computations that uh, we don't want to use because we want to think about uh, 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 rational decisions as uh, 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 ignoring all this context. And that's what probability theory helps us do a little bit. Uh, I have a question for Professor Evan. So during your talk, I was impressed in particular by two statements. The first one is that where, when you were studying finance, you were obliged to go through papers show, trying to demonstrate opposite things. And the second statement I was impressed by is uh, that you said that uh, even though the works by Bachelier and uh, Georgescu, if I remember well, are considered milestones in the economic theory, uh, economic students are uh, not obliged to study them, are not encouraged no, yeah. to, study, to study them. So in the light of these two statements, I would like to ask you uh, first. Uh, so about we have um, heard uh, from Professor Gigi Martina and Professor Sozzo the reason why physicists uh, probably feel that uh, economics uh, is uh, quite a hard science uh, to cope with because we are used to have uh, uh, a very limited set of simple principles from which we have to start when we want to solve a problem. And on the other end, uh, in, the econo in economics, there are so many more forces that uh, compete when one wants to, I suppose at least, when one wants to explain a phenomenon. Mm -hmm. So in the light of your experience as an economist, uh, why do you think that uh, uh, economists have, have uh, some difficulty in uh, uh, so, um, in um, dealing with the papers by physicists, with papers dealing with the, the concepts of uh, entropy and the Brownian mm -hmm. motion, because you say that they are not very, very well, studied. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. I mean, uh, the, uh, for instance, the entropy, uh, the, the, the issue of, of entropy, for instance, has been a big, uh, big problem in economics, especially because uh, Paul Samuelson, at one point, mentioned that if he was uh, refereeing papers which had the word entropy in them, he would just uh, kind of discard them right away. And Samuelson was a very famous economist, so he, uh, I have n I've never known why he was so much against uh, the idea of using that concept in economics, I don't know. But of course, if you do have those kind of very important people telling you that, look, they don't want to hear about it, then basically you have right away a, a whole... 
I don't know. I don't know, but that's that's a very well known uh, phrase he he uh, he had, on especially in his response to using entropy in economics. So he was not keen at all. Um, it's interesting what you say. I think the, the, the I think the answer has a lot to do with the training we get. And the training we get is, in fact, uh, although lots of people in economics think they have lots of mathematical training, in, in fact, we, we don't. And so I think we would benefit tremendously, I think. If I were to be a rector of a new university, I think I would, I would say, look, you want to study economics, maybe you want to study first e physics, and then go into economics, so that you have an idea of all the methods which are being used, and then see what the applicability is. The applicability are uh, the the potentials are of of using those methods maybe in, in in economics, but we don't have the training. We have very limited training, and therefore I think for us it's very difficult to start speaking about other languages, except for the language of, for instance, functional analysis of measure theory. That's that's about where it stops. But th but you know you know what happens with functional analysis and measure theory, right? This is a this is a very specific type of language, right? Um, which, in fact, physics people are not very keen in, in using anyhow, right? So, so, so there is this, that problem. So there's this emphasis on functional analysis and measure theory if you really want to do the heavy due type of economic theory, but physics people are not interested in that language anyhow. Um, so it's, it's kind of, um, it's the okay, that's one thing. The other thing is, if you look, for instance, at option pricing theory in 73, that paper, which was published in the American Journal of Sociology, which showed that actually it was an enormous market generated after the formula was actually what was proposed, because discovered, we have to be very careful with this thing. It's very interesting from from a, from a science phenomenon. You have something which is being created on the basis of a theory. Right? You have a theory, and then you have a phenomenon which is created after that theory is established. That's, I think, f not fairly fairly different from what physics would, would, would look at. And that's documented. So those are very strange things which are not concording with, with physics. An example of the, to my first reply, and, and also to your, your point of, of transition from classical to qu uh, quantum mechanics and so on, principle of least action, we know is, is all over in physics. I, I hope to convince you tomorrow that principle of least action can have a home also in economics, even in very basic equilibrium economics. Um, and maybe that will answer to some degree your, your query about what, what, what we can do with, with, with so, so general principles like least action in, uh, in physics. So, yeah, I think it's a, a question of training. It's also a question of, of events which are strange, like, for instance, a phenomenon which grows out of the development of a theory, which is very different from what I think physics. Okay. Let's see. Thank you. We'll save space for no more than one last question, if anybody wants to ask. Nobody? Okay. No, actually, uh, yeah. just one. Okay. Uh, okay, sorry. Uh, how, many, how large is the um, sampling you use in the data, of the, of the data which you use for your c computation? One million of data, one billion of data. Uh, how, uh, uh, what's the, the name of the author of the experiment? Oh, it, how large is It's Hampton. Hampton. Well, uh, it's difficult to, to collect uh, so big statistics in, 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 in psychology. Uh, you, 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 you. It is difficult to, to produce persons just putting them uh, uh, a beam in a polarizer and then split, splitting it. So for a psychologist, uh, the, the, uh, they consider a reasonable statistics the one collected on 200 uh, exemplars, so 200 su subjects. And uh, I don't know on how many persons, they, they, were, they were students, uh, and so we, we just took the, the, the membership weights collected by Hampton and, and we showed this. But uh, this is present on the paper and I can give you the reference. But I don't expect they are on the, uh, uh, well, the order of magnitude is uh, some hundreds, not too, not too much. Then uh, uh, there, there is another aspect, and it is uh, in, the, in these experiments uh, testing the validity of expected utility theory, for example, uh, on the Ellsberg paradox or Machina paradox, uh, you have a, even a, a poorer statistics. 
in the sense that uh, and the experimental data on this field are lacking and uh, I don't know why but uh, it is difficult to, to apply the, the techniques of psychology to decision making in uh, when reasoning on decision making under uncertainty. For example we performed an experiment with 60 persons so it was not so big statistics. We collected data we found that uh, a quantum model uh, can uh, can be used to represent the experimental data in the case of Ellsberg paradox but we don't know other experiments than the one by Ellsberg uh, in which they try to test uh, the experimentally the situation they know that the general behavior it is this one but they they don't implement tests on this so uh, I don't know. I I I I I told you something more, but <laughs> I don't know whether I answered your question. But in our experiment, for example, with concept combination, we had uh, 82 persons participating into the test. It was uh, presented in the form of a questionnaire, and for psychologists, it is a reasonably good quest. For 200, 300 persons, it would be perfect. Thank everybody for joining, also those who have followed us on streaming, and I will conclude today's session and hope to see most of us uh, still tomorrow for the more detailed discussion. Thanks everybody. Thank you.